Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Campus Star. Campus Star, which is um, led by the CEO, Mr. Frempo Yao Gideon. Can you get a wave? Yes. So that is Mr. Frempo Yao Gideon, probably known as Majesty. Yes, and the entire uh, Campus Star. An entire campus star crew. Ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you the 2016-2017 Genoa National President, His Excellency Wisdom Addo. Wisdom Addo. Yeah, let's show him some love, ladies and gentlemen. And he is His Excellency, Ebenezer Boatia Jumar. And we're having one beautiful lady in between the men. And she is an, the advisory board chairperson. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Miss Agnes Ade Mason. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my co MC. I'm still going forward and going by the uh, program outline. Next on the program outline is uh, we now invite the cultural troop to give us a display.
The next item on the program outline is um, we would have the speech from our first speaker, but permit me to um, kindly bring to you this uh, profile of our next speaker. Our next speaker completed her first degree at the University of Ghana in 2001 and obtained her master's degree from the University of Berlin some 14 years ago. She has worked in multiple ministries at senior levels, having worked at the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Education. At the Ministry of Education, she has held the position of Chief Executive Officer to two critical agencies, namely the Student Loan Trust Fund, SLTF, and the National Board for Professional and Technician Examination, NAPTEX. At both institutions, she has overseen the implementation of significant educational reforms and policies. Over the years, her work roles in education and finance has afforded her a broad appreciation and knowledge of relevant sectorial policies, public financial management systems, donor coordination, and an overall understanding of the operations of Ghana's public sector and institutions. In 2017, she joined the National Board for Professional and Technician Examination, NAPLES becoming the first female to head the institution after over 24 years in existence. She served on the governing board of Peking College of Education and has previously worked extensively with both private and public colleges of education nationwide. She has also served as a member of board of directors of the Association of African Higher Education Financing Agencies. AAHEFA and chaired the Legal Finance Committee of the Education Financing Agencies. Current is Thank you very much. It's amazing how many times we are called to deliver speeches and yet everyone is nerve wrecking. Outgoing executives, other student blocks present, family members, friends, and loved ones who are always present to give us moral support wherever we are, invited guests, the media, ladies and gentlemen. In a very strange way, I have made permanent friends with the student blocks. I call it strange because throughout my student life, I paid very little attention to the activities around student leadership. And a lot of what I know now about student leadership is informed by the friends I have made. I have gained a clearer understanding of the important roles and contribution of student leaders. And what I have learned from the Ghana National Union of Technical Students in particular has been eye-opening. I find your interest in national issues commendable and your hunger to understand and participate in policy dialogues very useful. I also find your particular interest around education even more laudable. Genius, thank you for inviting me once again to witness to learn and to contribute to the 27th Annual Congress of the Ghana National University Technical Students. This year's event is on the team, the role of the Ghanaian youth and the students in national development. I find your team useful considering the fact that we have a youthful population which happens to be the segment that records the high proportions of under and unemployment. Over the years, I have observed very carefully, I have observed your careful selection of teams to reflect not only the issues that matter to your members, 
but also to keep such issues constantly at the forefront of the national dialogue. The National Board for Professional and Technician Examinations, the institution for which I work, and for which reason I have had this honor to be present, is proud to be associated with your efforts. I feel very connected to your overall success because as part of your, as some of you may already know, one of the attributes of any higher national diploma education is the fact that it offers a uniform curriculum and assessment to all candidates, irrespective of whether you obtain it from a private or a public institution. The HND, just like many standards or international examination bodies, example, WAI and ACCA, is modeled to administer independent examinations or assessment to candidates from both public and private tertiary institutions. For HND candidates in particular, the curriculum is designed to give the student a good balance between the theory, the soft skills, and most importantly, the application. These three unique features of any HND program is why the labor market prefers you rather than other forms of students. In many private sector driven dialogues, you would usually hear employers say, I prefer HND candidates for my job roles. The question I would ask is, but why? Possibly one of you can tell me why the labor market prefers HND candidates for an accounting role rather than any other trained accountant person for the same level. Well, that's a good answer. From my interactions on such dialogue platforms, the reasons why HND students are preferred by the market include because they are trained to apply knowledge, which is what we mostly call hands-on. Because of how you are trained, your curriculum is designed, your curriculum and the way your curriculum is designed, employers say it takes a shorter time to train you on the job, which is at a lower cost to them. You are less expensive as a labor option, yet more productive to the areas you are trained for. Your early exposure to the world of work which is an integral part of your education, makes you what I described made for purpose. At the policy forums, what do we hear people say about HND? Again, you know I get some invitations every now and then, and I sit in and I listen. And so here again, I hear them say, HND students are trained to apply knowledge. With some support after school, you can easily be job created. Example, a, a furniture technology or mechanical civil or electrical engineer or catering and hospitality student who has obtained and earned their HND certificate. Here I say end and I'll come to that. Must be able to mobilize artisans or a small workforce to offer their immediate community services in furniture production, car repairs and maintenance, or delivery of healthy snacks or lunch to schools, hospitals, or the workplace. If this can be done well, your businesses shall serve the middle growing class who are dissatisfied with the poor finishing, low customer appreciation skills, and high degree of try and error of the apprenticeship trained business owner. Yet find the well, the big well-structured employers too expensive for our budget. Honorable Minister Chairman and distinguished guests, why am I saying all this? Yes, because I work closely with them, but also because there is a lot of work to be done to achieve the ideals I am talking about. Well, snapped 
Polytechnics shall continue to work with the various technical universities, polytechnics, and private institutions to improve on the expected outcomes. The student also has some responsibilities to the effort. The ability of our youth to support national effort at building a stronger Ghana is strongly linked to the investment to their investment in time and resources they put into preparing for their education. We are encountering a lot of gaps related to the suspicion that some of you are not earning your certificates. Some are adopting an ethical means to earn their marks and certificates. What this does is that it weakens the confidence the, the market has in HIV candidates. If some of you hold a certificate that you cannot adequately justify the market values placed on all of you immediately starts dropping. High academics without moral accountability values is a danger to the community and to the nation. As new and ongoing executives, you have a big role to play in addressing the values and ethical gaps we are confronted by as a generation. I understand how difficult it must be for all these tempting options available to you on social media. But we must remember that the footprints we leave as a result of our web activities shall follow us into the future. To the ladies and women in the group, let me, let's remember that in addition to our ambitions to be, to, to excel in our careers, we hold the key to the future of Ghana. Our values shall strongly influence the way we bring up tomorrow's leaders. I do not hold all the answers here and now, but all I can say is that because you leave permanent footprints by your activities on the web, be careful what you do there. Can you imagine how you would feel about me now as I speak? You are watching an inappropriate post, photo, or video about me. It doesn't matter what I'm saying, it doesn't matter what degrees I hold, it doesn't matter what I'm attained today, you will never respect me. You will make mistakes. I made some of my own. But your time is different, and so be careful. To the gentlemen, you all have mothers, sisters, and females in your life you adore. Treat every woman the way you want the females in your life to be treated. Let me conclude by saying, the desire to prepare for your rightful place in national development is a legitimate call. However, remember, realizing that call depends largely on how you make about your education and social experiences yesterday, today, and tomorrow. May God continue to bless the motherland we have called Ghana. Thank you all. Now, Buama, God will richly bless you for such a wonderful speech. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our agenda. Uh, we're having a wonderful speaker, equally as Ms. Sheila Nambuama, and she happens to be the CEO of WP. And she is the CEO of WPP and a former national woman of Chilot. Ladies and gentlemen, let's walk out. Madam Nancy Dunn. Let's show us some more ladies and gentlemen. And I am back. Yeah. I am back to say thank you to the young men who stood behind me and support of the ladies' agenda. Today, I am happy because this is what the current executives have been able to do. 
you see how their conquest is beautiful and well organized. Yes. And for that matter, I did inform you all that I will put my ears on the ground and my eyes watching the female, the female executives who the various institutions elected to lead them. And actually, per my research, I made people to do and I made follow-up checks. I noticed they have all excelled in their various institutions. And I'm here to honor them and to let you people know that together we can. Madam said something which touched my heart. That the men, you have mothers and sisters in the house, so treat us well. I will still make your indulgence to treat us well because tomorrow is never promised. I keep saying there is life after Jesus. That is why I will boldly come here anytime I'm being called on. Because if I didn't have good relation with the men who gave me their support and had hope in me and still do not give up on me, I wouldn't have been able to come back to give back to my union. The union that made me who I am today. The union that has given me the opportunity to get to wherever I want to go to. So today I am here to give back to my union. I am here to support my union, not only the female, but the men. I am here, again, to emphasize on the fact that we women are not vulnerable, but the society has made us so. And backed by we ourselves as women, we make it look so. Please help us, back us, give us the opportunity. Wherever we go wrong, help us, support us, correct us, and encourage us. We have males in prisons just as we have females there. So do not think that what you men can do, women cannot do it. But give us that support. That is what I will be pleading on. We are not rubbing shoulders with you. We are not, and we can never rub shoulders with you. But we we'll always plead on your conscience to support us, get to where we are, and be proud of us. by surprise, but uh, I would want to beg for your indulgence and uh, Madam, please kindly help me give them the honor of citation. From my outfit and the CEO of Women Power Possibilities, we recognize your efforts and struggle to face lift women through leadership and, and society as a whole. We appreciate your courage to contest men to attain the position that has always been tied for them only, which has made you an outstanding woman. Now, therefore, be it resolved that, on behalf of WPP, we bestow unto you the honor of Lady of Excellence, which is above all women which is, sorry, which is our highest honor for women who excel in leadership and above all women empowerment. Never relate the fight, together we can. And this citation is for Abdul Mumin Samira, the only female finance officer among this
word from a brief word from the student loan first fund if they are here. Okay, if they are not here, then we would proceed. For that matter, the next speaker would uh, give the opportunity to the next speaker to do his presentation, then we'll proceed. Uh, let me kindly read the profile of our next speaker uh, to you. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker, he has a background in finance, law development studies and communications. He started his career as a treasury analyst in 2006. In later years, he moved on to become a journalist and subsequently a lawyer. In January 2017, he was sworn in as member of parliament for Ofwasi, IRB, and deputy minister for information. In November 2018, he became the substantive minister for information. Honorable Kocho Opong Nkoma is passionate Officials of NAPTEX, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Let me start by saying thank you to your leadership for inviting me to be part of the 27th Annual Presidential and Delegate Summit. An annual gathering of this nature is important because among other things, it gives us an opportunity to share ideas, to arrive at positions on some key issues, and to advocate for matters that advance our course, and for us our course, in technical and vocational education. This afternoon, I'm being invited to speak to you about empowering today's student for nation building. And the focus is on mentorship. But if I have your permission, I'd like to broaden it a bit more to speak about empowering today's student for nation building in general and the various things that go into it. Do I have the permission to do so? Yeah. Right from the onset, let me mention that I happen to be a very young person as well. I am under 40 years. So it is exciting when I'm in the midst of young people who are not just young people, but who are seeking ways by which they can make an impact and influence all that we are trying to do in various sectors, specifically in education and in technical and vocational education. I want to start by making some general comments about education and technical and vocational education, and then I'll speak specifically to how we can work together to empower ourselves to play a stronger role in the nation building exercise. First, is to make the point that the government of Ghana, particularly the Akufuado administration, does not, does not oppose any policies or initiatives that are aimed at supporting the youth or education matters in general. Indeed, very often, you will find that it is a tradition that the Akufuwa administration belongs to, what we call the Dangwa Busi Adobo tradition, or for want of a better expression, the MPP tradition, that leads in interventions and programs that are aimed at supporting young people and education specifically. And we can give you countless examples. Many years ago, even though the Constitution talked about free compulsory universal basic education, at the very basic level, it was difficult for parents to keep their kids in school. And so the first Kufour administration introduced a number of interventions aimed at ensuring that 
more and more young children could get access into basic education. We introduced the capitation grant, which was aimed at supporting at the basic education level with finances that would allow school authorities to provide the basic logistics to keep more children in school and to support them. That was a product of the MPP administration, the administration that birthed the Akufuado administration today. Again, during the Kufu administration, we introduced what we call the school feeding program. It was aimed at ensuring that many children will be attracted to the basic schools Many parents will have an interest in taking their children to the basic schools because if you don't get that foundation in kindergarten and class one and class two up to class six, it will be very difficult for you to then get vocational, technical, university, tertiary or postgraduate education that will be built on that. Again, that same tradition sought to provide more contact hours for students at the senior high school level. And so we expanded the senior high school program from a three-year program to a four-year program. Unfortunately, it was interpreted to take a political dimension. And subsequent administrations cut back on the number of contact hours that we were trying to bring on board. We introduced what we call the model schools, where in every region you will pick one model school and expand and invest in it and make it a center of excellence so that around it you can grow some more talent. And when the Akufuwa administration came back after eight years in position, we have introduced about two major interventions still aimed at helping education. The first is the free senior high school program that I'm sure everybody is aware of here. Yeah. The reason for which the Akufuwa administration introduced the free senior high school program is simple. Education is a right that everybody must enjoy, whether your parents are rich or poor. Education is a right that no matter how resource constrained we are as a country, even if it's our last seed, we should put it into the education of the future generations. And that is why the Akufuwa administration budgeted about two billion Ghana cities a year and has been paying to the extent that by the time we enter the next academic year, as the President said recently, 1.2 million Ghanaian children will be going to senior high school for free. Yeah. It is because we believe that there should be a lot of investment in education. But in addition to that, we are also doing a lot particularly for technical and vocational education. The Akufu administration believes that technical and vocational education and training is a major pillar for national development. This country, Ghana, our inability to generate knowledge and enable the development of the skills of our people is partly to account for our hindrance when it comes to industrialization as a country. Our strategy, therefore, is to expand technical and vocational opportunities at both the secondary and tertiary levels, and thereby strengthen the linkages between education and industry. If we succeed in doing this, we will give more young people the opportunity to acquire skills and to deploy those skills to create their own jobs and to be employable in the broader Ghanaian economy. And therefore, on our part, one of the first things we are doing is that we are continuing with the program of enhancing what used to be polytechnics into technical universities. Yesterday, a very good friend of mine, uh, the former president and now the candidate of the NDC was here, I believe. And he spoke a lot about why the decision to convert to technical universities. What you notice is that for us, as a political tradition, we don't oppose good things in that supporting education. And so we are continuing with that program to enhance from polytechnics technical universities. We have never said it's not possible, we have never said it's not good, we have never said it's a bad idea, we are building upon it. We are not flip-flopping when it comes to ideas aimed at supporting education. Beyond that, we are also working to support a major campaign aimed at reinforcing the fact that technical and vocational education 
is where our real bread and butter economic activities can be boasted as a country. If you go to an organization, how many managing directors can they have? How many people can sit at the higher echelons uh, in administration? But the majority are those who are required in having hands-on skills, the hard skills, the soft skills, and the technical know-how at the intermediary levels of these organizations. And that's why we believe that technical and vocational education must be supported, and we are doing well to put resources into these areas. The government is also undertaking structural reforms by setting up TVET centers across the country. And I'll speak about that. But as a first step, we are setting up a TVET service and a TVET council. And we are dedicating a whole division of the education service to technical and vocational education with its own director general to give it priority and to attend to technical and vocational education in this country. I'm sure it's a good idea that you can go. The Ministry of Education has also been restructured. And now we have a whole deputy minister dedicated entirely to oversee the transformation and the building on that we are bringing into technical and vocational education. Because if you don't pay attention to it at the very top and you subsume it under mainstream education, you can't find the resources, you can't find the attention to it. And so at the Ministry of Education, we have now designated one deputy minister whose job is to oversee the reform that we are bringing about in technical and vocational education. Yeah. The Ministry of Education has also been investing in infrastructure and equipment for technical institutes, technical universities, and colleges of education that specialize in TVET in collaboration with international partners. In addition to these, 20 state-of-the-art TVET centers are being constructed across the country to bring learners up to speed with modern trends in various TVET areas and to make them more competent in their areas of study. Currently, over 400 non-tertiary TVET institutions managed by administrative agencies and offices set up under 18 different ministries which offer various TVET programs are being brought together so that that attention from the top can be given to it, support and resources given to it. That's the kind of attention that the administration is paying to technical and vocational education in this country. The government is also rolling out a one to one factory program, which is one of our flagship programs, and it's aimed at making our country an industrial hub, and it will require a lot of products from our technical and vocational institutions uh, and create a job market for them. Ladies and gentlemen, the MPP and the Akufo administration, for that matter, the government of Ghana believes that when we are talking about investing in young people, it should be holistic. Not just focused in one area, but holistic. And that is why we start off by saying that we must improve access to education in general. Our program or our policy is that no child should be left behind. And so every Ghanaian child must be given an opportunity to have an education. That is why, as I mentioned, we started with the capitation grant, the school feeding program, and now that we're back in power, we have worked on it, the senior high school, the free senior high school, and now we're investing in technical and vocational education. But we believe that when you are done with training young people and investing into them, you must also create more economic opportunities for young people at the top when they leave school. And that is why the administration is also pumping a lot of money to open up opportunities at the top by the time you are done with education. And so you notice that, for example, this administration argues heavily about the need to pump money into an industrialization agenda. Many of the times, the economic times that you see all over the world, talk of the Germans, the Chinese, the Americas, the Southeast Asian giants, have done so because they have been industrial powerhouses. One of the reasons for high unemployment and poverty in our country is because industrialization has been low. And that is why as an administration, we are pumping, if you read our national budgets, a lot of money into an industrialization program. Our one district, one factory program aims to, at the minimum, help ensure that we industrialize as a country by starting off with about 260 factories in these 260 districts. Currently, 181 are at various stages of construction across the length and breadth of this country. Yeah. 
know we haven't hit 260 yet. That is a big vision that we are working towards. But with the little resources that we have, we have currently ensured that you can find 181 identifiable projects under our one district, one factory program. Our aim, our objective is that as we continue to put more resources into this, by the time we are done, hopefully by the year 2020 with this first term, we can point to a large number of these factories that will commence the resurgence of industrialization in this country, provide employable opportunities for many of your colleagues who are understanding technical and vocational education, and provide jobs for millions of people along the breadth and length of this country. This administration is also not just investing in industrialization, but also investing in entrepreneurship development. We have a whole ministry for business development, which has been working to support young people who have brilliant business ideas to find their feet by creating their own businesses. The truth is that not everybody will get employed within a government job space. But apart from investing in young people getting an education, and creating more opportunity in industrialization, we should also target and support young people in entrepreneurship. And so, for example, in 2017, 7,000 young entrepreneurs were trained under the Presidential Business Support Program, with 1,350 receiving funding to go and start their own businesses. That's the mark of an administration that wants to create more opportunity at the top after investing in you at the bottom. 2,000 entrepreneurs were provided with entrepreneurship training nationwide in the subsequent year. So far, about 4,750 jobs we are informed have been created under the capacity building for young entrepreneurs and startups initiative. We are also building the entrepreneurship culture among the youth by training from as low as senior high schools. We are told that the senior high schools level uh, have managed to train about 7,500 through these entrepreneurship programs under the Ministry of Business Development. When it comes to women entrepreneurs, you have seen the videos and the photos on television for yourself. About 2,000 women entrepreneurs have received training in entrepreneurship to build their capacity for their own business growth. So at the very bottom, we believe that everybody must get access, whether you are rich or poor. We should invest more in technical and vocational education and eventually, when you come out, we should create more opportunities by industrializing and providing opportunity and support for entrepreneurship. If you look at Ghana's statistics today, you will notice that in the last two years at least, general growth of economic activity is going up. And it's also going up also in the services area, where many of you are training to acquire skills that can be deployed. Our belief is that as we have restored stability and we inject money into the areas that bring about growth, many of you, even if you don't start full businesses and companies, even if you don't get jobs in the industrial program, can also offer services as the services sector goes up as a country. Now, specifically to the question of empowering today's students for nation building. Colleagues, there are a few things that I'd like to share with you. We believe that as young people, generally, you should take a very keen interest in the entrepreneurship program that are being rolled out as a government for our country. Because it is in that space that, for those who may not necessarily be getting jobs in industry, for those who may not necessarily be starting uh, off at the low levels, it's in that space that you can also acquire the skills and the funding to search on and to create your own businesses to begin to employ some more people. As I mentioned, I'm a young person, and I'm proud when I see young people gather to think about how to build capacity and how to step up their play in the scheme of things. The president, the government, and all of us believe that young people should be given opportunity, resources, and support. You see, the reason is that the kind of ideas that young people have the kind of products that young people can generate, the kind of services that young people come up with, demonstrate an unparalleled talent or skill that has naturally been given to young people. And the job of the broader society is to support, to resource, to promote, and to encourage young people to excel in these areas. 
And that is why it's important that we young people continue to advocate every now and then for more space and opportunity. But the final point I want to share with you is that while we continue to advocate for more opportunity, we also have a responsibility as young people to become the change that we want to see. To become the opportunities that we want to see. The history of the world shows us that society never gives the right that you are asking for. You literally have to take it upon yourself. And so, one of the charges I want to give you this afternoon is that we ourselves have a responsibility to do a few things. When it comes to mentorship, for example, which is one of the major things that you are discussing or that you put up for discussion, while we wait and we say we don't have mentors, I would say to you that be the very one to start looking out for mentors. There are people across the length and breadth of your institutions and the Daniel Society who are excelling in various areas. The responsibility is on you to look for and to select and to choose your mentors. Don't just wait for somebody to come and look for you to mentor you. But you yourself choose mentors who you would like to inspire into your life or bring some inspiration into your lives. And don't choose mentors for the general reasons of some material or financial benefit, but choose mentors that you can actually learn and acquire some skills from. Mentors that you can benefit from an imbuing of their value system and their skill set into you. That first responsibility is yours. The second responsibility I think that all of us have, which I would like to encourage you to take up, is to take it upon yourself to build your own capacity. You very often hear, they say they want some years of experience. And you ask yourself, but I'm just out of school. How will I acquire that experience? You should take it upon yourself to build that capacity. What everybody is looking for, what every employer is looking for, is people who have hands-on skills, not just from the classrooms or from the labs or the workshops, but hands-on skills from industry. And the opportunity or the responsibility, respectfully, lies with you to acquire those hands-on skills. To put yourself in a space where you can practice, you can apprentice, you can work as an intern and acquire those hands-on skills that they will be demanding at the end of the day. It may not come as financial benefits today. When I interned first at the multimedia company, limited, my allowance was 40 Ghana cities for the whole month. But it is during that internship process that I learned so much, I acquired so much skill. And when I went back to school, the manager at the time, Mr. Kofi, who called me and said, I want you to come back and work with us. You have that responsibility to acquire those hands-on skills yourself. Nobody will give it to you. You owe yourself that responsibility to acquire that hands-on skill. You must also make it a point to acquire, and please listen to me carefully, acquire the intellectual understanding of the thing you are doing or the thing you are practicing. There are many who believe that when it comes to hands-on skill areas, there's not much science behind it. Just know how to do it with your hands. But there's a lot of science that goes into these practical skills we talk about. So don't just learn the skills, but learn the science behind the skills. In learning the science behind the skills, you can even develop new ways new approaches, new skills, new technologies for achieving that same thing. That is when you begin to innovate. So don't just acquire the skills, learn the science or the intellectual knowledge behind that skill. And as I mentioned, if they say they want years of experience, you can acquire that years of experience even while you are in school, through apprenticeship and through internships as well. The very last point I want to make to you is that you have to responsibility for what you want to see happen. We are a society where people believe we should just demand, we should rant, we should go on social media and talk. But I want to say to you that the responsibility to create the change you are looking for, the responsibility to positively impact the society, the responsibility to create those businesses, those skills, it lies with us. And I want to encourage you to take personal responsibility to start and to try. You may fail. 
you may most likely make mistakes. It's like a young man, a young woman learning how to ride a bicycle. You will fall a few times and get some bruises. Never mind. But it is in starting, commencing, making mistakes, learning from that mistake, but ultimately holding yourself responsible that you will get to that level where you have acquired the full skill to be the difference and to be the solution that we are all looking for. Be the example of excellence that we are talking about. We live in a society where people say, you know, this is how we do it. This is our, our, our culture. This is the standard where we come from. But I want to challenge you to be the mark of excellence wherever you find yourself and whatever opportunity that you take upon yourself. Be the one who wants to go the extra mile, the one who wants to do the extra hour, the one who wants to do the extra 30 minutes, the one who wants to go the notch higher, so that excellence becomes something that is a norm associated with you and not the exception. And I want to say something to and about the women. In our traditional Ghanaian society, a lot of women are pushed back. A lot of women are given reasons for which they should not search forward or be ambitious. And that's why I'm happy to see how women were celebrated uh, and awarded here this afternoon. I want to say to the young, dynamic women who are in leadership, who are participating in all of these exercises here, is that please don't succumb to the same old excuses that have held women back for decades. That I'm a woman, so I cannot. I'm a woman, so perhaps this is not my portion. <laughs> like we say, Tophi, I can refuse it. But what to encourage the women to show the dynamism that we know God has gifted you with and to search forward. Recently, I was in Go for a town hall meeting. A crowd of about 3,000 people were discussing three senior high school and among other things. Two young girls in senior high school got up ostensibly to ask questions. And you could hear from the memory of the auditorium that people literally wanted to shut them down and say, you are young girls, keep quiet and sit down. But these two young girls stood their ground, held onto the microphones, were not intimidated by the audience, and they asked some very probing and intelligent questions. At the end, I invited them downstairs to have a little theater chat with them and encouraged them that they had demonstrated dynamism that excited me. And I told them that I would look for opportunities to have them mentored. When I went back to Accra and I mentioned their story to the wife of the vice president, he said, could you bring them to me? I will give the mentorship from our team. It is in showing that dynamism, showing that sense of urgency, showing the agency that you have, stepping forward, that other people who support the women agenda can even rally behind and push you up and put you further. And so please don't succumb to the same old excuses that held women back. We know you are dynamic, we know you are strong. Let's see you excel some more. And to the broader group, to employers, to the associations, to the institutions, Mr. Dean, give the women the opportunity while you give young people the opportunity, particularly look for young women, support them and push them forward. There's a role that you have to play if this country will achieve the objective for which our forefathers and our forebears fought for our independence. That role can only manifest if you don't rest on your horse. If you pick the little that the government, the Akufuaga administration is doing by improving access, by supporting uh, technical and vocational education by supporting senior high school. If you pick it, and if you run with it and build on it to the next level, we'll see a lot more young, dynamic people join us and transform this country to what we want to see. So thank you, and God bless you. I'm for cholesterol and blood, ladies and gentlemen. I also will have the original accountant for Maslow, and he is Mr. Michael S. L. Mills. Let's show you some love for you. Uh, we thank God for having our first Secretary Secretary here with our Minister of the Government here. For some time now, as Africa uh, University, like any time we graduate, it takes over a year before uh, we are being given us. We want to go from our first uh, Secretary Secretary. The minister, why it's given an August, is always bringing us down every time we are applying. Thank you very much. I personally prostrate to the minister for information. The government of the day has enrolled staff 
which is a program that will help with the youth. But my question is, after the three years of the NAP, what next? Thank you very much. My name is Shekeli Komali uh, from Kofuridia. My question goes to uh, the minister and our mama. She made a comment that one of the major factors in industry is employing us as because we are cheap. In relation to our H and D, we are yes. So I want to know what the government and this perception really exists. I want to know what the government can do to help us because paying fees for H and D is even more than degrees. And a lot, we spend a lot on practicals and others. What is the government doing on this to the industry? We are not relatively low cost. Just say what they can charge. Our honorable minister clearly mentioned that even though the previous administration started the conversion of technique to the technical university system, and the current administration also take the uh, no, take that one and serve to continue it and make sure it becomes more successful. I would want to ask our minister. Um, over the years, you see the number of enrollments into the technical universities and the polytechnics reduces drastically. And so, what is the current administration doing to care that um, challenge we are facing? Reduction of enrollment every year. Thank you very much. I recently, I mean, as a permanent committee, uh, recently there has been curriculum, curriculum reform. Uh, those NAPCO personnel or NAPCO trainees in that case that we are not taking part of the reform that is taking place with relation to teach, teaching the students. Uh, this time around, we are left out of the reforms. Uh, when we are in the school, we teach. We perform the roles that we are supposed to play as teachers. So now that we are not taking part of the reforms, uh, after after the reforms in the curriculum implementation, uh, I want to request that we should also be trained or guided so that we can deliver uh, as our colleague professional teachers in the school. And uh, secondly. I will plead with the government to also uh, we are most grateful for what NAPCO has done for us. Uh, we appreciate what the government has done. But sometimes we experience delay in uh, the payment of our system. So we need the government to be something. Thank you very much, the woman is uh, our schools for techniques have been converted to technical universities and I, I think it's on paper but we don't really feel the, the changes in the instruments or the, our practical thoughts anytime we go for practicals we don't see it I believe that technical education should be practical oriented but all we do is theory so there is no much difference we are the traditional university, so I want to know if there are any plans for that. And the enrollment that my brothers they want to find out what is the plan of the government to make sure that students, my students that are moving from senior high schools, concentrate much on technical institutions. Thank you very much. Yay. Yeah, so thank you for your question. So anytime you have um, gathering of students, you can be sure that there will be some powerful questions coming through. I'll start with uh, NAMCO and uh, the two NAMCO issues together. Um, the first is that I think as part of the orientation for the NAMCO, uh, uh, I don't like to call them beneficiaries, but for the NAMCO participants, uh, there is an explanation of what the exit program is. It's a three-year program during which people will also benefit from entrepreneurial related training so that the services that you are particularly offering now, those that are convertible into businesses by the time you exit, you can run those as businesses by the time that you exit. During this period as well, as the public services open up, and we have, you know now we are out of the IMF program, where we had restrictions and could not recruit at the time. Now that thankfully we are out and our economic situation is improved, 
and we are increasing enrollment in the public sector, there are some who also find opportunity to um, get enrollment in the same line of work, but within the public sector, properly so called. For those of you who are in some of the institutions, as we open up space, there's that. And then there's a third option where some can also be contracted, even under the exit program, to offer those services to support the organizations that you are currently working uh, within. So uh, if there's feedback that we have to give to the people who are running the program to deepen the conversation of the exit options, we'll take that in good faith as well. I think the other comment on NACO was feedback, more or less feedback, about delays and other related matters. And we take the feedback in good faith. The Boga and WA Polytechnic Conversion Exercises, uh, if you speak to your student leaders that engage with your councils, they will explain to you that it is a process that you go through to meet what they call the technical criteria. And they are in the process of going through the meeting of that criteria. So it's not something that has been abandoned, but the criteria that was laid down to many of the other organizations or the other institutions have met. Your principals and councils are ensuring that you meet it so that you are also um, given that upgrade. There's a question about an increase in fees. All fee increases for public institutions will have to be approved first by Parliament. We have something we call the fees and charges schedule, so that MPs from across the country get to see the schedule and approve before they are sanctioned. And so whenever you are hearing of any introductions of fees, you have to check and verify whether or not the fees and charges schedule in Parliament has approved it. My understanding is that Parliament is yet to make those approvals. So always check, and then if you have to engage with your school authorities, you engage with them on the basis of that knowledge that I've checked. This is what Parliament has approved or has not approved. The last two, again, I'll put them together. Reduction in enrollment and more investment in practicals. The directive to the councils and the authorities at the technical universities is to ensure that there is more practical contact hours and more investment in the practicals. Because just by changing the name, if we don't invest more in some of those areas, then not much has been done. And so in addition to setting up the TVET centers that I talked about, which is generally for technical and vocational education, one of the directives to the authorities is to invest more in ensuring that practice hours are improved. It is also the reason for which some of the institutions say that if we are going to have to have more one-on-one -on -one contact hours for practice, then we need to watch the numbers. Because when the numbers are a bit high, it makes it difficult for that same thing you are asking for, the practice to happen. So it's a balance that the authorities are having to work to fulfill the big objective that we are all talking about. And even as we speak about it, I'm told that the council here is meeting upstairs. And before I leave, I have to quickly dash to do a quick representation to the council before I exit. But it is aimed at ensuring that we push them to do more contact or more practice hours for the benefit of the big agenda that we are looking for. I thank you very much. and the various institutions. And um, normally what should happen is some data is shared with NAPTEX, NAPTEX will go through, subject to the various quality assurance checks, including verification, and then return the, the, the data to the schools for, to validate the information. It's a lot of back and forth uh, between us and the institutions. And what we seek to do by that is to reduce errors in the certificates when they are finally printed. As institutions that conduct examinations, it is quite a dent on our credibility when you issue a certificate that has an error. We tend to get a lot of errors in the names. It's in the name, it's not too bad, but if it is in the grade, that the person was given, then there is a lot more investigation that must go in to be sure that the error is a legitimate one that, is, uh, that has to be fixed. So the timelines are as a result of this, but at NAPTEX, we want this thing to happen in a quicker manner. So what we have done is to set some policy guidelines for the institutions. 
And if they haven't reached that phase, we refuse to take the information. Then, because if they give it to us at short notice, then you find them giving us a lot of pressure because they want to graduate students. But our work must also be done and done well. If not, the entire exercise would lose some value. So we would work on timelines, and we would agree on a specific timeline that would inform candidates of when to expect their results. I think once that is done, there's some more clarity of information that you can plan with that going forward. The issue about the labor market, but I think somebody collected a statement from me. Um, if the person can give that section to the person who asked the question, I think if you read the entire statement, that particular paragraph, you would understand the strength in what I said. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to explain it as a standalone. So I encourage you to pick the strength up and read the, the, the paragraph that I mentioned, the comparative appetite for HIV people as against the other people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister and Mumi, for such a wonderful answer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I will we'll welcome the NEC to do the presentations. Thank you very much. As a token of appreciation from a grateful Jimmy for your contribution, your continued efforts. We deeply recognize your immense involvement and contributions to the cause of Ghana National Union of Professional Students. You are trying to show it. The membership strongly holds the belief that an appeal and a positive post image vitally important to show others the students and its programs. The hard work and efforts to beautify our Congress is an example you are. Your inflated commitment to the course of your business is without question. Your zeal and passion on this course must always soon you out. Presented this day, 15th day of August 2019, by the hand of President of Jews. Thank you very much, Honorable. And you will meet you soon. from a grateful unit for your continued efforts. We deeply recognize your immense involvement and contributions to the cause of the Ghana National Union of Technical Students. Your pride is showing a membership strong holds the belief that an appealing and positive post image is utterly important to how others receive units and its programs. Your unflinching commitment to the cause of the Ghana National Union of Technical Students and development is without question. Your zeal and passion on this cause has always showed you out, madam. This citation is presented on the day of August 2019. <laughs> Doctor, here on behalf to take it on behalf of Madam. So, Doctor, 
visualize. So, thank you.